All right. As advertised, for tonight's session, I wanted to uh, prepare you all for your next big adventure, which is going to be uh, the second half of your program and moving into your capstone phase. Now, your discussion board topic for Wednesday night is your first draft of your capstone topic. But at this point, you can't possibly know what your capstone topic is going to be because you haven't been actually conducting any research on it yet. At best right now, you have a fuzzy idea. You have a general notion of something that you want to get into. And that's what makes this part of the master's degree kind of intimidating because a lot of students look at this and go, my topic is so big, I can never cover it all. How am I going to fit it onto a web page? I can't possibly do everything. And then how can I possibly boil it down into something small enough to be a good story? So I want to share with you some good advice that I received over the years when I was doing research and in-depth writing, and also give you some techniques to help you boil down your own topic so that what you put up Wednesday night will be fairly tight, and then we will continue to refine it, you working with all of the rest of your faculty as you go forward over the next several months. So don't panic that you don't have it down into one beautiful thesis sentence right now. I don't expect anybody to be able to do a 25 words or less uh, Jeopardy answer for their capstone topic and uh, thesis paper yet. But let's get you on the road. First, I want you to consider that nobody writes a big paper or a big article by just sitting down at the keyboard and having it flow straight from their brain through their fingertips. Writing does not work like that. And in-depth writing and research writing definitely does not work like that. Instead, I liken it to the way that I drive from Daytona Beach to Panama City, something that I can still do on one tank of gas in one sitting. However, mentally, my brain would get tired way before my shoulders and my rear end. So I think of it is driving from Daytona to Jacksonville, then Jacksonville to Lake City, then Lake City to Tallahassee, then Tallahassee to Panama City. Even if I never stopped at each of those places, I still have mentally cut this trip up into 90-minute segments. So every time I knock off 90 minutes worth of the trip, I still feel refreshed. I'm up for going another 90 minutes. I used to be able to drive straight from uh, Central Florida all the way to Washington, D.C., 18 hours, stopping only for gas and uh, necessary biology. So it was a matter of mentally looking at the large task as a series of small ones. So fast forward to my taking my first doctoral class at the University of Florida. The old man of the program, uh, an old professor emeritus who actually invented the whole Florida community college system, threw an arm around me one night after class and said, Ron, a smart man would hit a lick on his dissertation with every class he takes. I, uh, I said, sir, I don't, I don't quite understand. And he, he said, every book you read, every report you write, every talk you give in class, every article you write up should be something that you might potentially use in your dissertation. That way, you're building a big stack of stuff, and then when it's time to actually write the dissertation, look how much you will have already collected. So by following that approach, I wound up with a whole banker's box full of file folders of articles and clippings and stuff that I had written, and I had a couple of backup disks with all of this stuff burned on it, so then when it did become time to start writing the dissertation, indeed, like he predicted, I had lots and lots of parts already in place. I didn't use them all. I still had to go get a few new ones, but I was 80% sure that I had most of the kinds of things that I was going to need. Therefore, when you get to the end of month 10, 
and the beginning of month 11 when you post your capstone project. That end of month 10 is not the time to be trying to figure out what your topic is and to start scrambling around trying to do interviews. Instead, every bit of homework you do from here on should be a further refinement of your area of interest, should be another interview, another excuse to go get some audio, another excuse to make an infographic or to get some photos done so that, let's say you've got uh, four classes to go, four weeks to a class, that's 16 weeks. 16 different pieces of homework that you can do where you get more interviews and pictures and statistics and collect information. So you should have plenty of things to work with when it's time to finally assemble your story. What we will work on tonight is trying to narrow down what your story will be about. But I encourage you to break this up into small pieces rather than to let it hang over you like some thousand pound weight. Instead, let's break it up into a bunch of 10 pound bags of potatoes. So here is the agenda for tonight. I want you to get this idea that the factual domains we talk about in research and journalistic beats are basically the same thing. They are areas of study. So if you were going to be a researcher and you wanted to study, oh, I don't know, the effect of nicotine on chimpanzees, right? You're doing primate research. So you're not studying fish. You're not studying birds. You're not studying refined sugar. You have a certain uh, area that you have narrowed yourself down to. Journalistic beats, you're going to be a police reporter. We call it public safety beat now because it includes fire and EMS. But you might be public safety. You might be doing politics. You might be doing crime or government or health care or sports or features or business. So there is some broad zone in which you want to operate. Now, uh, I have made comments to some students that it's okay to have a secondary or tertiary area of interest to. Just because I primarily write about politics and government doesn't mean that I will never write another sports or pop culture story in my life. So uh, just to cleanse the palate, I might do a little something different for fun. But primarily, yeah, I'm in that politics and government factual domain. So if I was doing research, that would be what you would call it. If I was doing journalism, that would be my beat. I'd be covering government and politics. Now, there's two things we have to get you to understand. Part of your problem is what to include in your major project. And I'll use capstone and project and major publication interchangeably. But your basic assignment, if you go back and review the capstone guidelines that are posted as a a resource for the class, you're doing a long, in-depth feature report. Not necessarily investigative, but certainly in-depth. So you will want to include enough pieces to fully explain the phenomenon that you're describing. But equally important is going to be what to exclude. If you visualize my pool table right now, it's got stacks and stacks of papers and books and magazines and documents because I am a sorter. I try and create order out of chaos. And as I'm working on a project, one of those piles is going to be stuff I'm not going to use because it distracts from what I'm writing about or it's an unnecessary detail. Doesn't mean it's bad stuff. It just means it doesn't need to be in this particular article. So what we're trying to do is to find that sweet spot. I, that is the zone at which you can write a deep and detailed story about a definable topic. So that's what we're trying to make happen, that you, you get a topic that is deep enough to explore, but not so huge that you would have to write a book instead of an article. So that that's what we're trying to find, something that is uh, Goldilocks would have said is just right. Now, one thing that will happen as I guide you in 
uh, boiling down your topic is I'm going to try and guide you to do stories that haven't been written before and therefore they're not available as something that you could just go grab and copy. Now, we don't worry about this as much in the journalism profession because plagiarism, while it does happen, is rare because the news hasn't happened until today or tomorrow. So you can't go right today uh, and copy the story about how the Homeland Security budget fight is going to shake out by Friday in Congress. That story has not happened yet, so you can't cover it yet. But there is a further technique that we're going to discuss to help you come up with a way to approach that subject differently than other writers might have done. So this way you can come up with your own spin on a topic that other writers might might be covering. Uh, they were they were talking today on the radio when the first NFL scouting combine was held. They did good to get one reporter from every one of the 32 teams to even show up to cover it. Now they had over a thousand reporters at the combine in Indianapolis watching these college kids work out. Can you imagine that all thousand of those people were there to write the same story? No, they were covering either alumni from the colleges that they normally cover or that uh, the pro team in their city might be trying to pick up. So all of them had a different angle in the way that they would put their story together. And then if it was a newspaper reporter instead of a TV or radio reporter, they would have different uh material components that they would need for their story. So I could easily see a thousand different stories coming out of that event just based on the number of combinations of people and kinds of coverage and hometowns. So that's what we're going to try and do. Figure out some way where whatever it is you're covering, you're going to do it with originality and difference. Now, often when people find out that I do any kind of writing, I'll get asked, where do you get your ideas? And of course, I steal them by looking at national news and world news. We had a previous talk in this class about how to localize international and major events. So if I can find a way to get a local hook into a national story, that gives me an idea. Another thing that you can do is intersect this with time and space, and we're going to talk about that. But, for example, uh, the 50th anniversary of Iwo Jima, when the Marines planted the flag on Mount Suribachi, that passed this weekend. If you watched the Oscars last night, you saw that this is the 50th anniversary of The Sound of Music. So anniversary stories are often good because we get that chance to look back at something. If we can find a way to take a topic that you're interested in and brush that up against some aspect of time or history, some anniversary, or brush it up against some unique kind of geography, then you go just beyond writing a generic story. And I want to en encourage you to look at this second point. As you start doing your research and you do follow-up stories and keep digging into your subject, your idea may change somewhat, and that's okay. I would rather that what you learn in the course of your reporting and research affect your story rather than you starting with the story already made up, and then you're just looking for evidence to back up your original conclusion. I will give you an example from my own work. When I was working on my master's degree, I was studying a timely subject then and now, which was international terrorism and how it's covered by the news media. And I had this notion that since terrorists do what they do to get publicity for their cause, that they hijack airplanes and assassinate people and take hostages and do all this stuff so that it gets on TV and gets in the newspapers, so that they can then spout whatever their, their position is. If we restricted and censored the coverage of those events, 
then the terrorists would not get what they wanted, and that would be a way that we would win, that we could beat them. Well, the further I got into my research, the more I found that anytime anybody tried to restrict that coverage, the terrorists would just do something more horrible that couldn't be ignored that had to be on TV. So now we're at the point where we have everybody has TV on their phone. We can't hide from videos. And when they start burning people alive and cutting their heads off and uh, murdering dozens of them at the same time, you know, you can't ignore that stuff. That's going to get out there on the Internet and show up on, on people's uh, video streams. So I was wrong then and I would be more wrong now. So when I wrote up my research, I could not ignore the fact that what I learned was different than what my original outline would have had me write. So I needed to change my outline because the facts that existed, verifiable out there in the universe, told me I was wrong, that I had a slightly incorrect idea. Therefore, I needed to change my paper to adjust to what the facts were that I actually found. Now, if we do a good job of helping you get your topics figured out, you won't be in as bad a state as I was, but you might make small adjustments. Uh, if you were covering something on health care and you thought that this particular exercise or diet was going to be beneficial, and then as you talk to more experts about it, you found, well, that's good up to a point. However, you also have to do this exercise that goes with it and um then it has to be monitored and there's more information, then, wow, you haven't found the miracle diet pill to be all end all. But you may have found some supplement that has shown to be useful in combination with other things. Well, then you got to put those other things in your article too. So be open to learning something along the way. We do the research, we do our investigation, because we don't know all the answers yet. If you already knew everything about it, why would you ever need to go interview anybody? So here is a technique that I think is useful. I like to take three things I might be potentially interested in. And aren't those colors pretty? But take three things that I am potentially interested in and lay them one over the other. And where they intersect, right, where you see my cursor is outlining this wedge in the middle, this is where all three of my ideas come together. So if I like dogs and I like TV and I like competitions, then maybe this little wedge is where I talk about the Westminster Dog Show because it's a contest, it's produced for TV, and it's got dogs in it. So I win. Right. I've got my little sweet spot right here in the middle. Now, the same would be true if I was writing about something on Outdoor Channel about um, field trials for hunting dogs. Or if I was uh, covering the military channel and there was a contest for uh, bomb sniffing dogs or uh, police dogs. So the same thing could be happening. Uh, but I still have my intersection of TV contest dogs. So many things might qualify, but because there is sufficient description, I now have a rich sentence that I can form to describe what I want to write about. So this is what I mean by the sweet spot, where we can take several interesting things and put them together. Then we wind up with a story that has layers, that has multiple dimensions. Now, how might I put this together? What, what are the general ideas that would go in these three circles? One way to start is that there is a theory. It could be a published theory, or it could just be a theory that you have, like the one I had that if we censored terrorist coverage, then they would quit blowing stuff up. So there is some hypothesis that we want to test. Might be mine might be some theory that exists out in um, physical or social sciences. But there's some notion that we want to consider. Then there is the practical part of it. 
So given uh, my bad research idea, how would you censor radio and TV and newspapers? Because if they can go live on the radio, how would you ever stop that? Oops, that's a practical consideration that I hadn't thought about, how we would censor broadcast media. Print media, even though it's constitutionally protected, you at least have until tomorrow's newspaper comes out to try and negotiate something. But with live satellite trucks, TV and radio can get out there right now. And just minimized my slide. Sorry. The third thing, as I said before, is that intersection of time and space. So when I started looking at it, I defined that the modern era of terrorism began with the 1972 Munich Olympics because ABC Wide World of Sports was covering it. And even Howard Cosell and uh, Peter Jennings were over there in Munich where they had the TV rights for the games when that hostage taking took place. So for the purposes of my paper, I said, I'm only looking at 1972 forward. Anything before that had not had live satellite international TV coverage the way that this incident did. That's one power that you get as the writer and researcher. You get to define the limits that I'm only going to write about American issues, or I'm only going to write about Texas issues, or I'm only going to write about since 2000, or I'm going to, we talk about history oftentimes, not by decades, because decades are kind of artificial. Um, History does not happen in neat 10-year slices, no matter how we sell our calendars. And if you think about it, Julius Caesar changed the calendar in his day, and then Pope Gregory changed it again. So however you want to count, we got to uh, the year 2000 and Y2K. That's totally an artificial number. Instead, we mark history more effectively by saying this is before World War II, or we talk about an antebellum house, which means it was before the Civil War. Or we talk about the classical period, which is the era of the Greeks and the Romans. Uh, We talk about a post-9-11 world. So we tend to segment history between major events, elections, wars, uh, disasters, those kinds of things. So when you are trying to define what you mean by time or space, Make it something that is significant to the way that you want to cover that story, because you don't have to feel that you are bound up by a county line or that you are bound up by uh, everything since the last election, that you can define whatever you need it to be in order to effectively tell your story. So I had a student literally at Florida State, who was working on such a thing. And she came up with a research paper topic like this. She was going to discuss Hurricane Katrina. And you see that that firmly establishes us in time and space, right? We're not talking about Superstorm Sandy. We're not talking about uh, the great Corpus Christi hurricane. We're talking about a particular event in a particular place. Now, Some people define Hurricane Katrina as being New Orleans. Those of us that lived in uh, that part of the Gulf Coast know that it extended also into Mississippi and Alabama. So uh, I might define my geography a little bit wider than other people. But still, we know what year and what part of the country I'm going to include and what areas I'm not. In emergency management studies, we talk about an emergency management cycle. That is the theory that is used to govern the way we look at disaster management. Here in Florida, I joke that we only have three seasons, hurricane, wildfire, and football, and that as soon as one is over, you start preparing for the next one, which which is very true. Um, When hurricane season rolls around, People will run down to Home Depot and they're going to buy uh, plywood and plastic sheeting and all that kind of stuff. And my question always becomes, what happened to the plywood and plastic sheeting you bought last year? Because it doesn't expire like a gallon of milk, but it happens every year. 
and people freak out and get prepared. And then after Thanksgiving, when hurricane season is over, then we uh, buckle down for the end of football season. And it, it is a continuing uh, cycle. Now, the practical thing that goes with this is a federal program, the National Flood Insurance Program. You know, you can't buy flood insurance just from a, a regular insurance agent. It is a federally subsidized program. And amazingly, people that live next to the seashore and next to lakes and rivers always seem surprised if there's bad weather and they get flooded out. You built your house by the water. When it rains, you could get wet. However, um, again, this happens over and over. So can you see how this student's paper, she's got Hurricane Katrina, so she's fixed in time and space. She's going to talk about this cycle of disaster planning, and she's going to talk about specifically to do with floods, which, as you may recall, the uh, lower ninth ward got horribly flooded. Uh, a lot of those poor people got washed out, most of which I'm sure did not have federally subsidized flood insurance, even though all of New Orleans actually sits below sea level. So when it rains, it's going to fill up in that basin. But isn't this a nice, tight, short thesis sentence for her paper? That gives her excellent guidance as to what she's going to build up. Even if she was just going to do this as a homework essay, an opening paragraph, one paragraph about Katrina, one about emergency management, one about the flood insurance program, a closing paragraph, five paragraphs, her little homework essay is done because the outline comes right out of the work plan that she made with that sample sentence. So, relax. This is easier than it looks. People have been getting graduate degrees for a long time. All of them started at this point, meaning everybody was overwhelmed by the universe of possibilities and was having their biggest problem trying to figure out how to narrow down everything that they could possibly work on. Remember, I want you to let what you find in your research, the information you get from the smaller stories that you do, I want them to shape your topic because the facts of the case should guide how your story turns out. Do not try to force fit the data to fit your plan, especially because, as we, it looks like we're going to make the faculty assignments, I will be the person reading your thesis paper the last month before graduation. So I'll be looking for invalid conclusions or data that got left out or some other way that uh, a story got tilted because it didn't do fair justice to what the actual facts of the case would have been. I'm very big about asking the next question. So if you have already asked it and accounted for it in your paper, we won't have any problem at all. Here is a way to think about this as well. We take three things that I'm interested in. Love helicopters. I like helicopters even better than I like fixed wing airplanes and I like flying. But helicopters are cool because they can hover. When I've done aerial photography, um, helicopters are the perfect platform because we can stay over a target or we can move back and forth. I like movies and television. I told you I watched the Oscars. I, um, I'm quite a trivia buff about old movies and old TV shows and things like that. So I find that interesting. And as a researcher, I've done a lot of work looking at public opinion in political polling, uh, looking at, at public opinion on social issues. Uh, I like polls and those sorts of, of uh, information sources. So how could I put the three of them together? Three things I'm interested in. How do I get a good story out of that? I could look at the public perception of helicopters as they are portrayed in film and TV. I could use specific examples of the movies and TV shows and the kinds of heli helicopters that showed up in them. Did you know, for example, on the old TV show Airwolf, that was a real helicopter that 
uh, actually uh, is used as an air ambulance by many uh, hospital EMS services. And then I could talk to real search and rescue pilots to get uh, their perspective on real incidents. Now, here's a trick. Many professors would actually write essay questions this way that forced you to know three things, and then you would have to write an essay that combined all those three things. That's why we do that, in order that you master three kinds of knowledge and push them against each other. Then I can tell whether you really understand them. What you do when you write a story like this is you help your readers really understand that subject because you will have come at it from three, three different directions. I know that there were people who asked me after 9-11, why didn't they just send up helicopters to rescue those people off the top of the Twin Towers? Because if you go by what you see in TV and movies, you would think Sylvester Stallone could be swinging from a rope and pulling people off of the buildings. Now, an intense fire with that kind of temperature and smoke output, it actually creates its own weather system. A helicopter can't even operate in those kinds of conditions. But we go by what we see on TV and we think, well, yeah, they can, they can always pull off these amazing rescues because I saw it in a movie once. If I was going to write this as a journalistic story, if I was going to frame this up as a magazine article, I would probably start with a quote from one of my local pilot interviews. I wish I could have done what they can do in the movie, said helicopter pilot Captain John Doe of the U.S. Coast Guard, recalling last month's unsuccessful rescue efforts off Ponce Inlet, which is a little seashore area here in Daytona. Then we would follow that up with the who, what, when, where of that incident where the Coast Guard could not save some stranded boater. I would be able, just coming off of these couple of paragraphs, to go into a story that explained how helicopters really work, how rescue efforts really work, why stuff that you see in the movies and TV might be phony. And I could explain that much better. And if my community had just had, had an issue of this, then maybe they really do need to be educated through my story to better understand how all of this stuff works. Now, working for a daily newspaper, I might be doing this double time and trying to get this story done in a week. You have the luxury of four months to work on this kind of thing, so you got plenty of time to hook up an interview with a couple of helicopter pilots, do research on uh, this particular rescue incident and maybe other similar rescue incidents around the country or around your local market, and even to go check out some uh, movie and TV DVDs that feature helicopter rescue uh, type scenes in them. So you would have the opportunity to do a little bit and a little bit and a little bit, collect a piece of this and a piece of this and a piece of this, and have all of your parts spread out on your virtual pool table so that you can assemble them into your feature story. And all the little pieces that you find could still be nice homework stories for the classes that you have upcoming. So can you see how your weekly homework can also be pieces of the big story that you will assemble later? It doesn't mean that when you get to the end of month 10, that you just take all your previous homework and just paste one after the other and say, well, there it is. You know you will have to arrange it, and there might be pieces to cut out, pieces that you merge, and so on. There will be an editorial process, but you should have enough meat to work with in order to put the thing together. So, do you feel like you have an idea how to tighten up your capstone topic, and how to build a research plan. I'll take a, a show of hands or a message in the chat window if you still have any questions. Mostly, I want to defuse the panic and to let you know that we can work on tightening your idea a little bit every week and every month as you go forward. 
because from now on, you're going to be working on this project in the background of the rest of your classes. The best way to not be overwhelmed by it is to pick it off a little bit at a time. It's the old story, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Any questions about tonight's program or how to go forward from here? Okay. Stefan and Lori don't have their, uh, their topic nailed down yet. All right. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn Lori's mic on and the rest of you listen because I'm going to try and talk her through this for a moment. All right. So, Lori, your mic is hot. Can you hear me all right? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Can you hear me? What, what are a few stories that you have done that you liked, that you felt uh, were interesting to you, that uh, covered things that, that you would be willing to look at again? I like writing about the wounded warriors cycling for rehabilitation and how it is keeping them. If it weren't for cycling and this rehabilitation, then either mentally or physically, they would be in a worse place than they are right now. Right. Okay. We can go two ways with that. We can broaden that to other types of activities like I have seen on uh, the Outdoor Channel that uh, some, uh, some charitable people have invited wounded GIs to go on um, organized hunts to get the guys yes. out in the woods and, and to enjoy that. I've seen it for uh, golf. Uh, so there are other sorts of uh, athletic activities mm -hmm. that wounded veterans could be involved in. Or you could go deeper on the whole cycling question. Um, are there special accommodations, accessories, engineering on the bikes that need to be done? Yes. Okay. Are there certain vendors that you can talk to about where these parts come from and uh, what the expense of that is and how did these guys get them? And uh, So the equipment question could be an area that you develop further, right? Right. Uh, you know about uh, how President Bush does his bike ride with the veterans. That's pretty notable. Right. So that would be a way to bring in some national interest to it. I actually rode with George Casey. He was the chief of staff of the Army a couple of years ago, and I rode with him uh, last March. Is that, somebody, have, is that somebody you could reach out to and get a couple of phone quotes or something from? Yeah, yes, he's very involved in the program. He's very personable, very nice guy. Okay. So what you, what you do at this point is if you want to talk about how veterans use this particular fitness activity as a type of readjustment and therapy and so forth, then I think we got to talk about the physiological aspect. So we got to talk to some trainers and some physical therapists and exercise physiologists kind of people. I think we need to talk to some uh, psychologists and counselors. We got to talk to some bicycle equipment people. We certainly got to talk to some veterans. I think you want to talk to some veterans families about, you know, how they are, are uh, better adjusted or calmer at home or those kinds of things. I know when my uncle George got back from Vietnam, he had been shelled in an air raid at Da Nang. And for the first few months, you couldn't make any loud noises in the house at all because he, okay. he was just so jumpy. Um, mm -hmm. So the adjustment process for the family, as much as the adjustment process for the veteran, there's a thing that goes, uh, uh, there's an aspect of the story to go with that. Okay. So already, now, we have a shopping list of five or six ideas that you could develop. Any one of them would be enough for one homework story in your classes as you go forward. Mm -hmm. But each of them lays a brick towards 
having a big in-depth thing about um, this phenomenon. You might even want to make a side mention of other types of fitness and fellowship activities that are not biking, just so you have a couple of other examples, because maybe everybody doesn't want to ride a bike. Okay. But there are other types of programs available for veterans who have other interests where they can still get that uh, fellowship and get out in the sunshine and be around other guys and, uh, and, and have still those same benefits. Right. And if your story gets picked up nationally, so uh, later on in month 10, part of what that course is about is how to promote your article to get it retweeted and picked up and pushed around the internet. Mm -hmm. What if somebody is reading it who is not in your locality? Mm -hmm. Well, how would I tap into veterans bike riding programs in my area? Is there some national directory of clubs or something? Mm -hmm. So every time you ask yourself the what next question, then that opens up a whole nother thing. And and pretty soon you have a shopping list of 10, 12 different things. And if you do a couple of paragraphs about each of them and have one multimedia item to support every other piece, you're going to wind up having easily a 1500 word story. You're going to have 10 or 12 different media elements, pictures, video, audio, charts, maps, all kinds of stuff. But you didn't try and build all of that in one weekend. Okay. Instead, you said, I'm, I'm going to just look at bicycle equipment guys this week. And I'm going to look at all these different types of seats, pedals, handlebars, straps, whatnot that, that are necessary in order to, to help them be able to do this. And then that's a whole thing right there. Maybe you make an infographic of a bike in profile, and then you have little things you can click on that uh, different accessories pop up. Just okay. go, okay, we could have this kind of pedal, or we could have this kind of seat and uh, uh, these different items uh, where you would modify the bike. Right there, that that's a whole interesting story all by itself. And that could have benefit for people who aren't wounded veterans, but people who have other types of disabilities who wish they could still ride a bike. They go, well, yeah, if a GI can do that, then why can't I do that? I could order that at my local bike shop. I could get back out there. Mm -hmm. So you don't know where your spinoff benefits would come from. Uh, this would be a place where somebody might write a comment to you or tweet back to you after seeing that story and going, I never thought of it that way. And then you start engaging in dialogue and then they pass the story on and that's how stuff goes viral. Okay. So well, that was very informative. I mean, you, you, yeah, I see how you really expanded it and, and then, yeah. Okay. Any individual sentence, if you probe it could probably turn into a paragraph or two. If you get into, well, where did that come from? Or how would you do that? Or if I didn't know anything about it, where would I find it? Okay. If, if, and from the stories that you've written, I feel that you're kind of writing to an audience that already understands your topic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now write to people who don't know a darn thing about it. Okay. And now you open up your audience, but you also wind up explaining aspects of it maybe even to participants who never thought of all of these things. Okay. okay. All right. Um, that was very informative. Thank you. I, I totally understand it now. Well, and, and, and this is why I think none of you should try and do this all by yourself. Get a buddy and kick the idea back and forth and say, mm -hmm. I want to write about X now. In order to fully flesh out this story, I got to have X plus one, X plus two, X plus three. What are my other factors necessary for explaining this? Because if I get too close to a topic, 
I already know all about it. It's already in my head, and I leave out all kinds of things that the general public might need to know because I already know them, and I don't put them in my story. So having somebody who doesn't know anything about what I'm doing, they will ask me those questions. Where do you find that kind of bike? How much does that cost? Can they use their VA benefits on that? Can they check them out at the base? I I don't know. But I would ask those questions, and then that would force you to answer them in your story. Okay. So so you need you need somebody to hold a mirror up to your story and see if you got it all covered. Okay. All right, everybody. Um, I'm gonna. At uh, Rob asked a question about where is the document. At the very beginning of this course, amongst the course uh, uh, documents right there at the uh, introduction back in week one, there there should be um, a capstone project requirements document. Um, if it's not there, let me know, but I feel certain it is because uh, I feel certain I posted it myself. When we get down to month 10, that will all be reiterated to you, and there will be some minimum standards about number of words and number of media artifacts and so forth. At this point, I would prefer that you just go get all that you can. Um, If you have a good variety of video, still photos, some audio, you made a couple of charts or maps, you have plenty of text by doing your interviews, you'll have enough to work with. The I'll go back to something I said earlier in this course. What the actual pieces are that need to be in your story will be defined by the kind of story you're trying to tell. Like Lori can, there is no way Lori can tell her story without a picture of a guy on a bicycle. That has to be in there. I would prefer to have video of several guys riding together because the story is about the uh, group therapy fellowship uh, kind of thing. So what needs to be in that story should not be a paragraph describing the parts of a bicycle. That would be wrong. A diagram of a bicycle, photograph of a guy on a bike, these become more useful because that tells me more what's going on in the story. So the form of the story and its components will largely be shaped by what the point is you're trying to get across. I mean, if you're telling a people story and I don't have names and faces, then that's a, that's a problem because I need to relate to these people that you're trying to get me to be interested in. I got to see their faces. If, on the other hand, uh, you're trying to tell me about renovation of some part of a city, I probably ought to have a map of the city that shows me what streets uh, are the boundaries for this development area. So what I need to see and what I need to read is going to be defined by what it is you're trying to tell me. Okay. There, There are no pat answers, but again, go with what you would naturally be curious about. And if it helps answer one of those questions, it probably ought to be in the story. If it doesn't help answer one of those questions, then it might be interesting background for you to know, but probably doesn't need to be in the story. Okay. Any other questions before I wrap us up? All right. I'm going to leave that discussion, Lori, that we did. I am going to leave that in the uh, audio recording so that okay. Miss the class can see what that talking out the topic sounds like. So when they get with their buddy, they have an idea of how to do it. Yes, sir. I totally agree. It was very helpful. Thank you. All right, everybody. Good night. And uh, um, I have all your discussion boards already graded, and I'll be working on your documents uh, tomorrow and the next day. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night.